Let's first welcome Sig Cross. Thanks for those kind words about me, Richard. I really enjoyed them. <laughs> I'm quite relaxed because I just finished a six hour lunch at uh, the Crocodile. And, uh, <laughs> so I'm feeling no pain. We had uh, 25 bottles for 11 of us. The usual suspects were all there, Berto and Spun and myself. So we're going back to 1943, seven years old, Bhutan. So I'm, I'm really relaxed. <laughs> I'm, I'm very passionate to speak about wine. So I'll get on with it. Uh, I don't know, it's hard to uh, say good things about the BC industry. I'm often too critical, but I'm going to do a few accolades tonight, I think, because uh, I decided to just talk a little bit about uh, six different wine types that I think are particularly encouraging for the Okanagan. And I know some of the speakers after me will have their own ideas that I'm off track, which I probably am, but I'll just go through them. The first one I'm going to speak about is Chenin Blanc. I think uh, like there's great potential for Chenin Blanc in DC. You look at what's happened so far, like planning to 1968 by row 13. Pretty impressive what they're doing there. I, I'm sure we've all tried their wine. They're making a great table wine that's uh, very, very good value. They're also making now the jackpot, which even though it's a little bit too alcoholic for me at 15.1, it's still a, a pretty good product. Uh, and the three tons an acre, uh, they're doing a good job. They're picking it too late on November the 8th, just to get that richness, but uh, it would be a little bit better if they picked it earlier, I think, but it's showing such great potential, and they're also using part of it to make a late harvest Chenin Blanc, and so uh, there's a good example of what's working, and uh, there's not very many other Chenin Blancs in, the, in BC. You've got, uh, for instance, Quail's Gate, uh, they're sourcing fruit from their own property in Donna de Soyuz, they're making their own Shannon Blanc and mixing 8% Sauvignon Blanc with it, which they shouldn't be doing, but uh, that's another story. But again, they're making a good product, less alcohol, very, very saleable and very popular. Uh, we've got Inniskillen Discovery Series making another, also a Shannon Blanc, very reasonably priced. These wines are a lot cheaper, like you're paying $35, $40 for the, for the Row 13, but there's a good commercial value there at $17 odd dollars, like to get a 12 percent alcohol Chenin Blanc that goes so well with food, so uh, I'm a big fan of Chenin Blanc, so uh, think about it when you're next buying it and encourage people to grow it. Secondly, I'm going to talk a little bit about Riesling. I think uh, Riesling is uh, a great uh, varietal that's so popular everywhere in the world. Uh, look at the examples of what we've got here in the Okanagan. We've got uh, Tantalus that did such a great job planting in 1978 under the Pinot Reach vineyard that uh, uh, is now coming into fruition. That's uh, vines that are 35 years old that are showing fantastic. Uh, they've got the old vines freezing that sells out so quickly. Uh, that's the old vines that were planted in 1978. And just across the road there, Anne Spurling's got the same thing. Her property with her great grandparents started 150 years ago. Also planted in 1978. It also is so fantastic. But those vines have such a good balance and that they age so well and uh, you can't go wrong, you can enjoy them uh, uh, as a just aperitif, you can have them with food of all sorts and you can have them for dessert. But there's a lot of great Riesling out there now, like uh, at the Lieutenant Governor's Awards of Excellence this year, the Synchro Mesh uh, was a winner of just so fantastic. The, the, it's just sort of like Eaton Valley or Clare Valley, Australian Riesling only better. Uh, but I love all the things that are being done there. Look at Cedar Creek, look what Daryl Brooker is doing there. Like he's got 2012 Riesling. He's got the regular, he's selling it at under $18. The wine's coming in at 9.9 .9 alcohol. It's got fantastic 10, 10 uh, total acidity and about uh, 12 grams of residual sugar, but it tastes so dry. And of course, he's also got uh, his special reserve, uh, which is $25 more, but it comes in at eight degrees alcohol, which is so refreshing, you can really drink a couple glasses of that, and uh, you, don't, you don't believe uh, that that wine's got sort of almost 25 grams of residual sugar because the acidity is a 12. It's just, uh, I'm pretty really a big champion of what's happening with Riesling here. I think Riesling is doing well in Ontario and some of the other places as well, but I think uh, you can't go very far wrong uh, to promote and encourage people to be growing Riesling. How much time do I have? <laughs> uh, 
But there's so many different people. Uh, I know Tim Posse, I'm just making a note here, he was so excited about Peller in the August edition of the Courier saying that they were giving this line away at eleven dollars. Like, how can you uh, even Tim Posse is recommending recently from Peller at eleven dollars, it must be good. <laughs> I like uh, also what they're doing, like they're growing it even like in Sedoka. I mean, look at the scout vineyard at Orofino, and even what uh, like they're doing at the little, little farm, that they're doing a great reasoning there. And uh, so it's not just growing in one area, it's not growing in Black Sage and Golden Mile particularly, but it's growing in quite a few areas. It should be encouraged. Uh, the third point I'd like to talk a little about is white blends. Uh, white blends, I think, are a little bit underrated. They started uh, a while ago, particularly with Sauvignon Blanc and Simeon, and uh, particularly just Jack, uh, Jackson Trigg, Sumac Creek did a great job with it, Mission Hill Fall. Some of the smaller wineries tried to do a blend of that, but uh, nobody would buy it because they didn't know what white heritage was, and they were able to sell Sauvignon Blanc as a single variety, or Simeon as a single variety, but they couldn't sell it as a mix, and so a lot of people abandoned it. Uh, but it's coming back, like uh, Clos Soleil just won at the BC Wine Awards that we judged uh, at the Okanagan Fall Festival. It's the best wine at the festival with their Capella. That's a beautiful wine at 12.3 alcohol that just sings of freshness and 90% uh, Sauvignon Blanc, 10% Simeon. Like, that's a killer wine. Uh, we need to encourage more of these wines. And what I like about uh, these blends is that they're now experimenting with other things. The hottest thing at the moment, in my opinion, is the white blends with Roman mixes. And uh, I opened at my house about a month ago uh, some old uh, ones from Twisted Tree, which is now Moon Cursor, that started in 2005. We opened up all the 2009 blends that they made. Uh, the Rosan Marsan blend was just sensational. You would swear that that's like a conjurer. It was so oily and rich. Uh, even the Viognier was good uh, with the, with the Rosan. Uh, they're planning more of that. It's a uh, uh, proper, they're only getting about three tons an acre, the beauty is about four tons an acre, but it's it's economic, it's very popular. Uh, even uh, like uh, Vieux Pan are making the Ava, they, they're doing a great job with that. It's a super wine, the 2011 had 78% uh, and 11% of Roussan and Marsan, the 12 and the 13 are going to have more Roussan and Marsan. Uh, that's a real power, you see uh, row 13 doing the same thing. Uh, with that thing, but I like also that there's other white blends that you should be aware of. Uh, like, look at what uh, Sink and Bob Tennant have done. Quit laughing in the back there, David. You're next. Uh, look what they did uh, with their, their thing. They took uh, the Black Hills, got rid of it, took some property high up in Aramana, decided to plant El Reno and Verdeo, and they just uh, planted that. Uh, 2008, now they've got the first crop of it, the 2012 uh, that they uh, had out that's uh, uh, very, very exciting. They had before that also the Figaro, uh, which was again was the Rusan and Marsan that purchased grapes. But I think all of these uh, white plans are things to look at. So, a quick summary of the whites. I highly recommend Shannon Paul, Riesling, and white plans. I understand that Pinot Gris is the biggest planter. It's okay, but it's always boring. Uh, Chardonnay, Chardonnay uh, is planted. Some of them are good, but because we don't get enough uh, from all the ripeness, they're all over uh, They're pretty good. There are some good ones. Uh, but uh, rather than go with what's happening, I think we need to look at these three different whites that are doing so well. Under the reds. Uh, reds, I'd like to, uh, in spite of Merlot being the biggest planted one, I think it's okay. It's a little bit boring as well. Uh, I'm a big fan of Pinot Noir. I think Pinot Noir is very, very successful in DC. I think it's going to get even more successful. Uh, you look at what Blue Mountain has done and started with. Sensational. Really underrated. Uh, not necessarily friendly to the public in the early days. The new regime has become very friendly. They, they showed that they were very outstanding. They got invited down to, to Oregon for the Pinot Festival. They showed so well there. They're doing a great job. Look what's happened at Quail State. What's happened at Cedar Creek? They're making great Pinot Noir. Look at all these smaller wineries, particularly in Aramana, that are just doing such an outstanding job. Like you've got uh, Foxtrot. They're making fantastic wine. I spent a full day there in October uh, trying every barrel. They're doing wild fermentation uh, and uh, wild yeast. It's unbelievable what they're doing. Maybe their wine is a bit expensive, $54.90 or whatever, but it's worth it. We had a dinner at the Wedgwood uh, last month. There was a sensational wine with porcini risotto. 
world class. Look at these other small armies. Look at, take uh, Howling Bluff and Luke Smith. He entered the Lieutenant Governor's one, he entered again in one. He tore out all his Bordeaux grapes. He's put all his eggs in one basket with Pinot Noir. He's clever. He knows what he's doing. I hope he can keep that going every year. Look at Stoneboat. Look at their, their wins of Lieutenant Governor's. They, they're doing a fantastic job. But it, at all these competitions this year, like, there's cheap Pinot Noir, and, and there is not really cheap Pinot Noir anywhere in the world. You try and buy Pinot Noir anywhere. And uh, I know when Dave and I were down talking in Chile, we were talking about how Chile need to be more expensive with their Pinot Noirs because uh, uh, they're making such good Pinot down there as well. But uh, I think that we've got a great opportunity here. Like you see Red Rooster, you see uh, uh, the, even uh, Kelowna Artist Series, those wines are really cheap. 14, 15, 20 bucks. They're making great wine for Pinot Noir. Uh, I really support what's happening there. I could go on forever, but uh, I've got a list here of so many people I wanted to mention, but I'm not going to have time. Uh, I'm going to go on to Cabernet Franc. I think Cabernet Franc is certainly the Cabernet Sauvignon of the Okanagan. Uh, what I like about it is that I think we have an opportunity there to have one of the greatest wines in the world. They're making Cabernet Franc of course in Bordeaux, and you can have it in, on the right bank, and you can have it mixed with Cordoba Cheval Blanc, and you can have it in Chanon and Bordeaux and Loire, but nobody's making better Cabernet Franc than we are here. Uh, it just needs a little bit more time, a little bit older vines, a little bit lessening of what they're doing. I love what uh, Sen Rofield has done, like she started uh, planting this way back in the mid-90s. She was smart, she didn't plant Cabernet so much. She went with Cabernet Franc when we all told her she was stupid. She was clever. She did that, and it's right in every year where the Cabernet Sauvignon isn't. And so uh, we did a vertical of all her wines back to the mid-90s. They were all were showing very well, and they're just getting better. In fact, she's got so much confidence now. She's done the 2010 Oldfield Series, and uh, all her wines have been underpriced, about 17, 18 bucks. But the Oldfield Series, she's so confident. She's charging $35 a bottle, and it's probably worth it, because she's got 15-year-old uh, vines there from the diamond back over there on Black Sage. It's really impressive uh, what she's doing. And uh, there's other people that are doing great work with Cabernet Franc. Look what Burry and Alba's done since they planted theirs in 1998. It's always the first wine that they have that sells out. I love uh, what other people are doing. Uh, Poplar Grove, they did, uh, they got a Lieutenant Governor's Award for the 2009, and even though it was 15-3, and I criticized it with Ian and Tony. Uh, they brought in the 2010 and 14.8, and they tell me that the 2011 will be down at about 14.3. Like they're getting the alcohol down there, they're realizing that biggest isn't best, and I think that the flavor is there. They're going to be able to bring that wine in a great flavor and uh, have a nice drink of product uh, that we should be looking forward to and promoting because that's got a lot of potential. That Cabernet Franc. There's nobody else that's doing it better, and uh, and it's doing well in plants too. You look what, uh, for instance, uh, Jackson. Uh, Don Triggs has gone, uh, Don and, and his wife and Sarah, like they got a new winery there in Colmina, they've got a new wine called Hypothesis, it's 40% Cabernet Franc, and it's uh, a blend, but it's mainly Cabernet Franc, and it shows fantastic potential, the first vintage of it, like all these blends of Cabernet Franc are also good. But let's leave, leave that and go on to Syrah, I won't take up too much time, but Syrah, it would be my uh, red favorite, I think. I think that uh, everybody loves Syrah. I think whether you know a little bit about wine like I do or you know nothing about it, everybody likes it because it's so attractive. It's got that spice that it's capable of being in so many styles. Like it can be uh, like almost a big Barrasso type uh, roasty, uh, honey kind of character from Black Sage, or it can be sort of light, like Nichols started that way up in Nirvana. He started that way back in 1989 in sort of like a own style. People are collecting his wine still today, and like that's, you go from that style all the way down to what they're doing uh, in Black Sage. Like everybody's making great, great Syrah. I can name here, off the top of my head, 30 people that are doing great Syrah. And uh, I just think that uh, that's a one to champion. I cannot, okay. Anyways, uh, I had fun talking about this. I just think that we need to be a little bit more open-minded about what we can do here because to get people to recognize these wines, we have to make excellent wine. And I think to just make uh, sort of a mediocre Pinot Gris or to make a Sauvignon Blanc with eight grams of residual sugar, that will make it, David. I know you're going to talk about rosé, but rosé or some of these other things are great too, but not today. Thanks a lot.